Good morning, Professor. Thank you very much for your time uh, and for joining uh, uh, for the interview. And uh, of course, we are extremely happy to have you on our TV show. Let me introduce you to the Georgian audience. Uh, today we have um, an extraordinary guest, uh, one of the brilliant minds of contemporary world, a historian, a author of iconic books, Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, uh, Homo Deus, A Brief History of Tomorrow, and 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. Um, a person who can foresee and whose presence today on Georgian, on our Georgian TV show is a really historical event for the Georgian audience and especially for Georgian youth. We see it as your support, uh, especially for Georgian next generations. Professor Yuval Noah Harari. Today we are going to talk about uh, the world after the war in Ukraine. Also, yeah. we would like to hear your view about education, artificial intelligence, and uh, the human being of tomorrow. But let's start, uh, of course, with uh, the war uh, in Ukraine. Mm. Uh, what do you think? What are the best and the worst case scenarios at the end uh, of the war in, uh, war in Ukraine? You know, what is at stake is really the entire global order. The recent decades, the world has experienced the most peaceful and prosperous period in human history. It wasn't free of problems. It wasn't free of violence. I live in the Middle East. I know perfectly well that there have been problems. But you know, since 1945, it didn't happen even once that an internationally recognized state was simply destroyed, wiped off the map by an external invasion. This was very common before in history. You know, all the Ottoman Turks and the Tsars and the Mongols, this is what they did all the time. And it didn't happen in the last few decades because we managed to establish a more peaceful and orderly uh, uh, global order. And this was also reflected in the budgets of governments. For most of history, all the sultans and kings and khans, they spent most of their money on their military, on fortresses and armies and things like that. In the early 21st century, the average expense of governments across the world on the military is just 6%, which is very, very little, and which enabled governments to spend much more on healthcare, on education, on welfare. Now everything is at stake because Putin has broken the biggest taboo of the global order. He's trying to simply destroy a country, a country that didn't even threaten him. If he succeeds, this will destabilize peace all over the world because dictators and regimes all over the world are watching to see if he can get away with it. And it will also cause defense budgets around the world to skyrocket. We already saw Germany, for instance, doubling its defense budget. So the money that should go to teachers and nurses and social workers will instead go to tanks and missiles. But it's not too late to, to, to prevent this catastrophe. If Putin loses, if Putin is not allowed to win, then it will actually maybe strengthen the global order. Because it's like every social norm, that if some, some bully tries to break it, and the bully succeeds, then the norm is broken and the order collapses. But if the bully fails, and if everybody sees that he fails, that actually the social norm becomes stronger. Then dictators and militaristic regimes, they are reminded, you can't do that. You cannot just invade and destroy another country just because you want to. So it's, it's, I don't know what will happen. I can't foresee the future. But we are clearly at a very critical moment in history when we have two very different options before us. Yeah. 
And uh, let's speak about the, uh, the mistakes uh, the West uh, we have made. Um, can we see what are the mistakes that the West should never make again, considering the lessons learned after Russia's invasion, Russia's last invasion in Ukraine? Well, I think that actually the West reacted to the invasion more quickly and forcefully and in a more united way than anybody expected, certainly than Putin expected. You know, there is very widespread support for Ukraine. Nobody is telling Ukraine, no, 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 just give, like, you know, with, with Hitler and Czechoslovakia. It didn't happen this time. They didn't tell Ukraine, no, just give up to the dictator. They supported it. Uh, you see even countries like Finland and Sweden now joining NATO yeah. and sending arms to Ukraine. You see Switzerland imposing sanctions on Russia. You see big oil corporations pulling out investments from Russia, which nobody really thought it would, it would happen. So actually, Putin thought that he would divide the West and show the world how weak the West have, has become, and he's actually achieving the opposite. He's uniting the West, and uh, again, I don't know what will happen, but there is a chance that actually the West, the, the, and, and not just the West, but the, the whole democratic world will emerge from this conflict stronger and more united than it was before, and realizing that you need to keep a united front and against these kinds of, of you know, militaristic dictators. And those who try to blame the West for the war, you know, you have the propaganda coming from Moscow and people are saying, yes, but uh, NATO is expanding and the threat of Ukraine joining NATO, it, it, it left the Russians with no choice. This is nonsense. Nobody forced Russia to start the war. Nobody was threatening Russia. You know, for people who say these things, I would like to ask them, please name the country that was about to invade Russia in 2022. Who do you think this country is? Do you think the Germans want to again invade Russia? Do you think Napoleon is about to come back from the dead and lead the French army to Moscow again? This is ridiculous. Nobody was planning to invade Russia. Um, it was just, I mean, all, all, all these fears, these fantasies, they are just in the mind of the Russian leadership. Yeah, in one of your interviews, you suggested that if only Putin could wait several years more, the U.S. and Europe will be dismantled from existing uh, internal confrontations and cultural wars. So what uh, will uh, the future world order look like after Ukrainian wars, war comes uh, to an end? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think that if, just, if Putin just waited five more years, ten more years, then the West could have self-destructed. Because the West in recent years has been torn apart by a culture war between left and right and liberals and conservatives. And you see what's happening in the US uh, between the Republicans and the Democrats. And you see what's happening in the European Union with Brexit and with leaders like Viktor Orban trying to kind of sabotage the union from within. So if Putin just did nothing and just waited, he could have succeeded actually. But maybe he's dying, I don't know. Maybe he's too impatient. Maybe he just miscalculated. And now, again, I, don't, I can't prophesy the future, but the West has a chance to save itself. The most important thing is to end the culture war within the West. Because if the West stands united, it has nothing to fear from anybody. You know, the Russian economy is smaller than the economy of Italy. The size of the Russian economy is like you take Belgium, you take the Netherlands, together you get Russia. That's it. They have something like, before the war, 1.5 trillion US dollars, that's the GDP. The European Union is about 15 trillion dollars. And that's without Britain and without the USA. So the biggest danger is the internal culture war within the West. And I think Ukraine, uh, the Ukrainians, give us inspiration to understand that the whole culture war is based on a mistake. You know, this thinking 
that you have to choose between uh, 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 nationalism and liberalism, and the right chooses nationalism, and the left chooses liberalism. It's a mistake, because there is no contradiction between the two. You see that the Ukrainians are fighting both for their national independence and to establish a liberal, free, open society. It goes together because nationalism and liberalism, they are actually united by the ideal of liberty, of freedom, which is common to both. And similarly, you had all these populist leaders saying that you have to choose between nationalism and globalism, between loyalty to your nation and cooperating with foreigners, as if there is a contradiction there, and there isn't. Nationalism is not about hating foreigners, it's about loving your compatriots, and there are many situations when in order to take care of your compatriots, you need to cooperate with foreigners. And again, the Ukrainians show this to us because one of their chief war aims is to join the European Union. Nobody can doubt the intense patriotism of the Ukrainians, and yet they are fighting not just for national independence, at the same time, they are fighting to join the European Union and to cooperate with foreigners, and there is no contradiction there. Uh, I see. Uh, looking at, uh, for example, um, can we say uh, who uses uh, the modern information technologies and information war tactics better, Ukrainian or Russian? Can we say for sure that uh, Ukraine uh, is winning the information war, or do we have two parallel information realities uh, or information war models? And uh, if so, what are the geographical frontiers of the uh, Ukrainian and Russian information warfare space? You know, in, in the West, the Ukrainians kind of, of, of completely trash the Russians in the information war. And it has mm -hmm. immense impact uh, of the, the huge support for Ukraine. You see flags everywhere, the, the sending arms, sending volunteers, sending money, supporting the refugees. So there, the, the Ukrainian victory in the information war is, 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 is complete. Of course, in other parts of the world, it's different. In Russia itself, uh, the censorship and the government propaganda keeps a large part of the Russian people in ignorance of what is really happening and trying to brainwash them with this nonsense that they are fighting Nazis and, 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 and ridiculous things like that. In other parts of the world, in China, in India, in Brazil, it's kind of um, um, more, more contested. Um, but again, when we look at the bigger picture of the world, I think the most interesting is really this triangle of Russia and China and India. Because Russia is in danger of becoming a puppet of China. You know, with all the talk that Russia should, is, is afraid of being invaded by NATO, NATO has no plans to, to, to conquer Russia. The real threat to Russia comes from the east. You know, east of the Ural Mountains, in the vastness of, 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 of the Russian territory, there are like 30 or 40 million people, and immense territory and resources. And uh, this is an area that China, is the, uh, 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 very important to it. And the biggest danger looking decades ahead for Russia is that it will actually become a puppet state of China. And of similarly, with regard to India, you know, um, India and Russia had a very close connection for decades. India gets a, it, its biggest weapon supplier is Russia. But if Russia becomes a Chinese puppet state, then in India will have to break away from it and come closer to the West because India's biggest fear is a war with China and if it gets its weapons from Russia and Russia is a puppet state of China and there is a war between China and India, India can't rely on Russia. So I think that even in the broader world, the, not just the information war, but also the, the real war on the ground, it completely changes the, the, the balance of power in the world. Yeah, as we started talking about the information warfare in China, uh, let's move on to the role of AI and modern technologies uh, in the yes. coming world. 
Uh, so, as you said, who controls the data? He controls the world. Hey. And uh, there are uh, two uh, big states, the U.S. and China, who have much more opportunities to harvest the data than any other country in the world. Yes. So, may we suggest that in the future, countries in the world will, uh, will uh, unite, will group around these two axes, the U.S. and China, hey. and the balance between them will create, will shape the future security order. Or, in other words, uh, uh, will we have two groups of states, uh, one of which will try to use data in its hands for unprecedented control of people, while the other will follow more human-oriented approach? Mm -hmm. I think that every country in the world now should be aware that we are entering a new phase of imperialism and colonialism that we are entering kind of the, the era of digital empires and of data colonialism. That, you know, in the past, to control a country, you needed to send the soldiers in. Now, increasingly, to control a country, you just need to take the data out. Just imagine the situation in Georgia, let's say in 20 years, when all the most personal information of every journalist, every politician, every judge, every military officer, all the information about them is held by somebody in Beijing or in San Francisco or maybe in Moscow. You know, every, their medical condition, their every sexual encounter they had, every bribe maybe they took, every joke, everything about them. Is it still an independent country or does it become a data colony? What happens when the entire country is run on very sophisticated computer and AI infrastructure, which is actually provided and controlled by another country because you don't have the technology yourself to do it? And this becomes a new kind of empire. And you know, the data is harvested all over the world sent to the imperial hub, to the center, whether it's China or the US or some, somewhere else, used both for political control, but also for economic control. Because in more and more industries, the most important asset now is the data. Of course. You know, even in, 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 in very old industries like textiles, the most important thing today in the textile industry is not the cotton, it's not the factories that produce the shirts, it's the data about what customers like and dislike. It's about the latest trends. So when all the data from all the world is harvested by a few corporations like, I don't know, Amazon or Alibaba, so they can actually control even the economy in, in, in far off countries. So this is now a danger that all countries should be aware of. At present, there are just two countries who are leading the race in, in AI and data harvesting. This is China and the US. They are dividing the world between them. You know, in the Cold War, we had the Iron Curtain. Now we have the Silicon Curtain. Which part of the world do, do you belong to? Do you belong to the American side using Google and, and, uh, 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 and Amazon? Or do you belong to the Chinese side? using Alibaba and Baidu. This will increasingly divide the world. Now, I hope that smaller countries, by cooperating between them and by implementing wise policies as soon as possible, will be able to kind of escape the complete control of these imperial giants and create a somewhat more balanced world but we don't have much time to do it. I mean, it's moving so quickly. Yeah, and um, talking about the threat of AI, uh, uh, there, are in, uh, there are the need of a new Bill of Rights, uh, which mm -hmm. should defend uh, a human being against uh, uh, modern technologies. Yes. So, what should the new Bill of Rights look like to achieve this goal? Hmm. So, there are several principles that we should enshrine and, 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 and defend. 
One principle is that the data collected about me should be used to help me and not to manipulate me. And we already have it in many other fields. Like I go to my doctor, I share very personal private data with my doctor. My doctor is obliged. She has to use this information to help me, not to manipulate me. It's not legal for the doctor to take my personal information and sell it to some corporation or some political party that will use that to manipulate me. So it should be the same with also the big corporations or, or, or the governments. Yes, you, you can collect more information about me, but use it for my benefit, not to manipulate me. The second principle, never allow all the data to be concentrated in one place, whether it's a corporation like Amazon or whether it's a government. Because this is the road to dictatorship, to totalitarian dictatorship. Somebody who knows everything about everybody, that's the ultimate dictator. So it should be separated. We should have several balancing agencies, institutions. So for instance, the healthcare authority, which collects information in order, for example, to stop epidemics, shouldn't share this data with the police or with my employers. It should remain separate. And the third principle is that whenever you increase surveillance of individuals, you must simultaneously increase surveillance of the big corporations and the government. So it's not only top down, it's also bottom up. If they know much more about me, but I don't know much about them, Again, this is dangerous. This is the road to totalitarian control and dictatorship. But if it's balanced, okay, the big corporations know more about me because we live in the 21st century and they collect all this information about me. But simultaneously, I also know more about them, about whether they pay their taxes, about their policies, about their dealings with governments. Then we have a balance. And it's possible to do that. The same technology that is used to monitor me, we can develop the tools to employ this technology to monitor the big corporations and also the governments. So, as we started talking about uh, giant corporations, what do you think, Professor? Is there any difference, is there a difference between the approaches of Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk towards the goals and areas of using AI? and whose approach seems more human-oriented? I'm not an expert on that. I'm, I'm not sure what exactly are their policies and what are their aims, so I can't comment on that. But I can say that it's very dangerous that individuals who don't represent anybody, they were not elected even by the American public, let alone by the humans around the world, that they have so much power to shape the future, really the future of humanity. I mean, who gave them this, this authority? Where, where, is it, where did it come from? And yeah, AI has the potential to really change the course of the evolution of life on Earth. That, that's amazing power. You know, for four billion years of evolution, all of life was organic. You look at, at us, human beings, and you look at dogs, and you think about, I don't know, plants like bananas and tomatoes, we are all organic. And suddenly, mm -hmm. we are beginning to create inorganic entities that can make decisions on their own, that can move independently, that can take action. This is unprecedented. And it's very frightening if uh, uh, the, the, the policy and the course of action on this such an important development is actually decided by a few business tycoons, billionaires, who don't really represent anybody except themselves. Yeah. Uh, talking about AI and modern technologies, you often emphasize the growing threat of uh, inequality and the gap between the rich and developed and small and less developed countries. Uh, so, yeah. and it's high time to talk about Georgia. 
What mm -hmm. should Georgia and uh, the countries like uh, Georgia do to not only survive but uh, also be successful in uh, the era of uh, technological revolution? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so first it should be noted that small countries in this era are, are not powerless. They can uh, become leaders also in, in, in fields like AI. You look at my country of Israel, you look at Estonia, for instance, they made huge advances. But the key is to cooperate with a lot of other countries. But if you, because if you compare Georgia or Estonia, with the United States or with China, obviously it's, 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 it's not really a balanced situation. But if you have all the European countries working together, not just adopting common policies on regulations, let's say on privacy, but also building together an AI industry which competes with the Chinese and the Americans adopting different principles, then there is a real chance of, of balancing these two big forces and of trying to change the general course of the development of this technology. So I think that the two key issues is first of all to cooperate with other countries and of course to try and adopt the best policies within the country. How, for instance, to protect the privacy of, uh, of, of citizens of Georgia how to protect their, their information from being exploited or harvested by both powerful interest groups inside the country and also outside the country, and how to educate the new generation mm -hmm. for a completely new world. Because the key thing about education in the 21st century is that no, nobody has any idea how the world would look like in 2040 and how the job market would look like in 2040. We are not sure what kind of skills will be necessary. And we can't wait until 2040. We need to educate people today. So I would put my emphasis, and not on learning a particular skill. You don't know, maybe this skill is automated by 2040, but on teaching people how to keep learning, how to keep changing, how to keep an open mind throughout their lives because they will have to change and learn and reinvent themselves again and again throughout their life, which is very stressful, very difficult psychologically. So I would stress the need to develop flexible minds, open minds from an early age to cope with this new world of extremely rapid change. So, and uh, again, uh, what, uh, what will be your, uh, the most valuable advice to Georgian youth? What should they do to be more competitive uh, in education and especially in the global labor market? Mm. Um, so, uh, again, nobody can foresee how the global labor market would look like in 2040. You don't know which jobs will disappear and which new jobs will emerge and what kind of skills will be necessary. You know, today many people go to learn how to code, how to be a coder, because there is a huge demand for that. But maybe a lot of coding will be automated within 20 years and other skills will be needed, for instance, uh, uh, psychological skills, because you see more and more big corporations they encounter very difficult psychological and even philosophical questions that they need to solve in order to, 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 uh, 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 to produce good products. You know, to, to design a self-driving car which makes decisions by itself on the road, you need philosophers. You need, of course, engineers and coders, but you also need philosophers to, you know, answer some very old questions if there is uh, 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 I don't know, you're about to run over two kids and the only way to prevent it is swerve to the side and, uh, and hit a wall and maybe endanger your own passengers, what should you do? This is something philosophers have been arguing about for thousands of years, but now you actually need to program uh, uh, the, the, the algorithm, the computer that controls the car to do it. So you need philosophers. 
And to take a, a, a very different example, if you think about medicine, so usually people think that doctors are far more prestigious occupation than nurses. But doctors that only diagnose disease and recommend the treatment, there are different kinds of doctors, of course, but if we focus on a doctor that, you know, you go to the doctor, you explain what you feel, you do some tests, blood tests, whatever, and the doctor takes it into account, uh, 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 figures out what's, what's your disease, and gives you a prescription. This is something that will become very easy to automate because it's simply data coming in and data going out. In contrast, a nurse, which needs maybe to replace a bandage to a crying child, that's much, it's not just data. She needs or he needs good human skills, good motor skills, good psychological skills to deal with the crying child. It's much more difficult to automate the job of the nurse than to automate the job of, of, of the doctor. So trying to understand what kind of skills will be important, it's not straightforward. Yeah, uh, in one of uh, your latest interview, uh, you highlighted that uh, the main goal the West should seek um, is in, in Ukraine is winning the peace, not the war. And yes. for us Georgians, it is crucially important that the peace and the new security shield created by the West after the war should cover, should include Georgia as well. What steps should Georgia and the West together take to achieve this goal? Mm. Now, I, I, I'm not an expert on, on the particular situation of Georgia, so that I, I can't give, you know, kind of concrete steps what, what Georgia should do. I hope that, again, as, as you said, Europe needs to win not just the war, but also the peace, which means not just to rebuild Ukraine, to rebuild what Putin is destroying, but to invest in the country so it becomes a prosperous, is something that will be the best defense of Europe against any future Russian threat. It's, it's, better, it's, it's a better defense than any number of tanks and missiles. Uh, partly because it will inspire the Russian population to achieve the same thing in their country. And I think this is also true of Georgia, that if Europe and, and the West helps it to not just preserve its democracy, but also to become a prosperous country, that countries around it that maybe chose differently, that maybe chose to go the way of dictatorships, they see, look how prosperous they are, this is kind of the best defense policy um, because hopefully this will encourage the neighboring countries to also go the way of uh, a, a democracy that invests in the healthcare and education of its citizens and not a dictator that invests the money in uh, his secret police and building tanks and missiles and, and things like that. Um, so a lot depends, really, on the, the, the result of, of the current uh, conflict. And there is also, of course, a big opportunity here because uh, 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 Russia is much, much weaker than it was before the war. And people realize that it's actually a much weaker, weaker country than they thought. So there is, if, if, if the right policies are adopted, there is a good chance to not just win the war, but more importantly, to win the peace afterwards. Yeah, as, and as we're running out of time, let's move on to the last question about civic nationalism. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the most valuable lessons that Ukraine gives to the world is how civic nationalism works on the ground. Do we believe yeah. that the future belongs to civil nationalism? And if so, what should be done uh, um, to achieve the dominance of civic nationalism over ethnic nationalism in uh, mm -hmm. the multi-ethnic countries like Georgia? Mm -hmm. uh, I think the key message that should be repeated again and again is that nationalism is not about, about hatred, it's about love. Nationalism is not about hating foreigners or hating minorities. Nationalism is about loving your compatriots, the other people in your country. And, you know, during wartime, you show your patriotism by fighting for your country, 
or taking care of, of soldiers and things like that. But most of the time, fortunately, we are not at war. So the way, for instance, to prove your patriotism, your civic nationalism, uh, most of the time is, for instance, to pay your taxes honestly. Because, you know, you have these populist leaders that claim I'm a very big patriot because I hate minorities. This is not patriotism. This is just hatred. You want to show that you're a patriot, you pay your taxes, because what are taxes in, in a good country? I pay my taxes so that somebody else in the country who is not my family, who is not my friend, but he is a member or she is a member of my nation, they get good health care. This is patriotism. And similarly, uh, if I'm, I don't know, I'm a government minister and there is a big contract to build a new road and I can give this contract either to my cousin who gives a bad offer, but he's my cousin, or I can give it to a stranger, he's not my cousin, but he gives a better offer. Patriotism means I give the contract to this stranger because this serves the interests of the public and not the interests of my family and friends. So if we remember that this is what patriotism means and not hatred, I think we are on the right way. Yeah, thank you, Professor, for your interview, for your outstanding job. We look forward to having more opportunities for uh, interviews with you in the future. And of course, we'll be very, very honored to see you in Georgia. I will be happy to. Thank you. Thank you.